All right, we're going to start here. I know a few people are joining uh, at the last minute, but in this fun eating in your lap, getting ready to talk. <laughs> this requires lots of coordination. This is part of your liberal arts education, eating in the lap while you listen to someone, right? So <laughs> got to be ready for anything. So uh, we welcome our alumni that are also joining us via Zoom today. And uh, we have a few little administrative things to talk about here before we get started. Um, the uh, sign-in iPads, or uh, they will be coming around. Make sure you sign up with your student ID. Make sure you put the zeros. Uh, make sure everybody, every student does sign up. Uh, even if you are not necessarily needing it for credit, we want to have uh, a listing of everybody that was here today. So I'm really excited about this program. We've got a lot to accomplish in a little bit of time. So, uh, but I did want to make you aware that um, the mask policy, so you're eating now. So we do have more than 50 people here. So when you're done eating, you do need to put your mask on. Uh, but while you're eating, of course, that's impossible. Uh, next week is our next event with the McDermott Center, and it is part of our Young Alumni Series, and Ashley Wong from uh, 2016 will be here. We want to make sure, same place, same time, that you make a point to come to that as well. Uh, she's about, what, five years into her career. She's going to be talking about transitioning uh, from being a student to uh, her career, and she's also pivoted already once in her job and she's going to talk about how that went so some very relevant information for those especially you juniors and seniors but all of you as you think about uh, transitioning so but today i'm really excited about our mcdermott medal uh, presentation uh, and i'm going to read this so i make sure i say it all Nor normally i wing it but um so we're here today to honor a friend of mine and a former colleague megan casey glover as she is this year's McDermott Medal for Excellence and Entrepreneurship recipient. As I said, this is extra special to me because in my previous career in Indianapolis in the technology, uh, Megan and I worked together at a company called Compendium, which was co-founded by a DePaul alumna, Ali Sales Roach from 2003, and Exact Target co-founder, Chris Baggett. And then I went on to work for another Chris Baggett company when Megan started her current venture. Um, and so I remember sitting down probably week four or six into her new company and she was getting her feet wet. It was a two person company and we were strategizing revenue models and how, you know, how she was going to go out and raise money. Uh, and it was two people. It was her and somebody that was remote, I think, you know, that, uh, so two of them starting this vision of a company that now has 72 employees and is growing like crazy. So it's, it was a lot of fun times. At the time, the office, the uh, office of her current company was a desk that sat in the middle of the company I was working for. We were all around her. And we came in one day and our boardroom suddenly became her supply house and we had all these 120 you know, these uh, water kits that suddenly showed up that we were working around to have meetings. So that's, that's the life of a startup. You know, you do whatever you gotta do. So it's been wonderful to see. The company I'm talking about is 120 Water, which Megan is the co-founder and CEO. It's a digital water company that provides software and water testing kits to government agencies, public water systems, and facilities who are tasked with managing drinking water programs that protect our public health. Since founding in 2016, the company has seen rapid growth and is serving over 200 water systems across 30 states and impacting over 15 million lives. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked with her before as a data and software veteran prior to founding 120. Water, she, was, she spent her early decade as an executive building and scaling various software as a service platforms in Indianapolis, including Angie's List, Compendium, Delivera, Rick Software, and Dino. And I think three of those have founders from DePaul as well. With a passion and knowledge base for utilizing modern software technology to solve problems. Now, does that sound like a liberal arts degree right there? <laughs> using technology to solve problems, you know, using solve problems. Anyway. Um, uh, you know, she's, she's, ah, here we go, provides modern software tools necessary to solve some of the most complex drinking water challenges. Uh, Megan, as I mentioned, the company has grown to 72 employees, of which 10 are DePaul alumni. Now that alone should give her the medal. That's got to be a percentage record 
of you know 72 employees of which 10 10 of those are DePaul alums so you guys as you're looking for careers keep that in mind um, and I'm gonna name a few of them because these are kind of personal acquaintances for me as well Anthony Ryan is the chief revenue officer Sarah Young 2012 vice president of sales Abby Warner 2002 vice president of client success and there are many other members outside of the C-suite as well. Ali Sales Ro Roach, formerly in the, in the C-suite, is now doing marketing consulting. Kate Swanson, 95's executive director. Lowell Huffman, 06, is strategic channel manager. Scotty Hunt, 2012, national account manager. Molly uh, was McConaughey, 2012, national sales manager. Liz Johns, 2020. So you, some of you may know her, sales development rep. There is definitely tiger spirit in the house <laughs> and in Zionsville, Indiana. So that is awesome. Um, she's a 2004, Megan is a 2004 graduate of Paul majoring in communication arts and sciences. She's currently the 2021 Indiana Chamber Dynamic Leader of the Year and also one of Inc.'s 2021 Female Founders 100 list. She currently resides in Zionsville with her husband, Tristan, also a DePaul alum in real estate and commercial real estate and their two children, maybe future Tigers as well. Please welcome Maggie, Megan Casey Glover as she shares with us her insights to how DePaul liberal arts leadership and entrepreneurship fed her career. Welcome Megan. <laughs> I, I, I think it's just mic drop Steve. We can all exit stage right, as my uh, advisor Steve Tim would say uh, back here at DePaul University. But I mean, no, sir, when I, I was actually so glad when DePaul snagged Steve, because to, to say he was instrumental, I mean, I love working with him at Compendium, but to say he was instrumental in helping me understand what the heck a cap table was <laughs> when we started 120 and, and how all of that uh, really materializes when you're starting a business. Um, could not have done it without him. Sad to lose him officially in the tech community, but so proud that he is uh, here. This is um, you know, where you need to be, Steve. So thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Humbled um, <clears throat> to be here receiving such an award today because I certainly don't feel like it's been 20 years since I graduated from Dahan and really amassed such um, an award or honor. But um, one of, in the time we have left today, just wanted to talk a little bit about DePa to entrepreneurship and my experience um, over that time and how sitting in your shoes, that might have been the last thing on your mind, or on my mind at least. But quick quiz, anybody taking a look at these logos know what they all have in common? or currently founder and CEO of DePograms. And I know, listen, I would be spending hours goes on a slide if I did it all. So this is just a sampling of the types that are companies that are run and started by DePa founders. But my guess is that if you were to ask um, Brittany Heiser, uh, who is the co-founder and COO of Pluey, as a junior at DePa, hey, are you going to revolutionize diaper changing stations through UV sanitation? She would have laughed. I know that because I know Brittany, and I went to college with Brittany, and that was the last thing on our mind, diapers and changing tables. But yet, she's out there literally revolutionizing how diaper changing stations are being installed in facilities. Um, or, if you would have asked Jason Becker if he would be in Indianapolis successfully running and being CEO of two, not one, but two software as a service companies, Dino and Riggs, he would have said, hell no, he would have been in Chicago. Um, again, I know that because I know him and I know where we were as juniors at the top. So I think if you were to ask others on this list what they thought they would be doing as freshman sophomore, junior seniors at the top, it's probably not starting these companies. At least it wasn't for me. But I do think there are some commonalities that probably everyone in this room, as well as entrepreneurs and leaders, wanted to do with their careers. And I think the first is that I want to lead. Right? I want to be in a position where I'm able to lead. Number two, now does this sound like liberal arts? I want to solve complex problems, right? That's actually a goal, um, a value at my company when I work, is we expect everyone to show up every day solving complex problems. Um, and number three, these are all groups that I'm going to And the third is I want my career to have purpose. 
right? I want to do get up every day solving complex problems. It provides purpose not only in my professional life but my personal life as well. So for the next time we have left, probably around 15 minutes, we just kind of love to walk you through my journey, which is just one of many entrepreneur journeys from the paw into the forming of a company, the running of a company, and hopefully maybe there are some lessons that can be learned and pay it forward for you all as you're sitting there thinking, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do after the paw? If it's not a very linear, I know I want to go into law. I know I want to be a doctor. It's very clear what my sights are set. For many of us, it's not so much. So again, uh, sit back, ask questions, raise your hand, um, but just like to spend some time walking through that journey. So I guess it starts with why did I choose to talk? Um, so Steve, you, my, my title was, let's see, Generation Z, um, you know, into my great, great, um, aunts and grandmothers and uh, grandfathers, but that's actually not why I chose to talk. Um, I actually didn't want to choose to talk because of that reason. <laughs> I just kind of didn't want to do what my parents wanted me to do. Um, but anyway, once I learned what I could accomplish at the talk, because I was very active um, in high school and realized we could get a good education, um, but also be involved, play golf. Um, I was in theater. I did theater all growing up. Right? That could be a possibility. I sang, right? I was in various leadership positions. And DePa gave me all of that, right? A well-rounded, wonderful education with the ability to continue to be involved in various things. And so I did just that here at campus. So graduated in 2004, my time on campus, um, I found myself doing theater and eventually kind of going into a communications major. Um, and then my junior and senior year really found myself in leadership positions with Canada my senior year actually serving as president. And it was at that time where, through that opportunity to be on student cabinet, really got to interact with the PAW community. And I think for many of you in programs where you're able to connect with the PAW alum, you guys can all agree that we have an awesome community, right? And just seeing that in action and the types of um, alums and career paths and just impact that they're making, not only with students, but out there in the world, was just really, really interesting. But I still did not know what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> Had no idea. Um, in fact, my senior year, I was saying, okay, well, fine, let's just default. I'm going to go to law school, following my, my parents' footsteps, and that'll be a stable kind of career to go down. Um, but I could not visualize myself what was going to bring me purpose as an attorney. And I, I know there's lots of purpose, and I'm not knocking that. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm like, I don't have to do that. But, uh, but anyway, um, it was really hard for me to imagine what my career path would be five years from there. And so I remember sitting down with President Bottoms at the time, and he said, if you don't know what you're going to do, there's a job opening in the annual fund, and that could be a good opportunity for you. So um, I applied, and I actually didn't get the job. I actually went to my friend, and also O4 graduate, so if you're taking notes at home, if you're on there, Matt, <laughs> or here, um, that is real world rejection number one, okay? I didn't get the job. So now I'm sitting there, probably like many of you will eventually after you graduate, being like, what the hell am I gonna do? Like, I missed the open enrollment for law school, like, what am I qualified to do? So little panic mode set in, I'm a communication major, what am I qualified to do? Uh, so anyway, uh, I got a call, thankfully, from the annual, off annual fund office a couple months later saying we've had a position open up, you know, we'd love for you to join it, and it's yours if you take it. I'm like, okay, good. So um, I used that opportunity. I had, my job was basically twofold. One, I had a territory, and I would go around and raise money um, from alums uh, for the annual fund. And then also I ran the Young Alumni Program, the Gold Council. And so I basically took a year and basically filled my roster with all of the most interesting alums I can meet. So that opportunity really took me to world around surgeons, the Mayo Clinic, um, marketing executives at Kansas Soup, um, to eventually a woman by the name of Angie Hicks. And the first time I walked into that building, it was an old firehouse in downtown Indianapolis, and there was a fire pole, and literally there were people sliding on the fire pole. <laughs> this is so cool. And uh, so I wanted to learn more about the company. And so, long story short, I applied for a couple of jobs. And my hiring manager called me and said, you're not qualified for any of them. So by the way, if you're keeping note, real world rejection number two. Um, but you, know, you have some entry level skills. 
skills that we think could be very interesting for some you know, problems that we need to solve. So I came in and joined, and I started their blogging program, and I ran their brand enforcement division. Um, none of which I had experience with, but because I kind of had this complex you know, problem-solving communication background, they thought I was um, good enough to tackle on these, these products. And sure enough, I actually worked my way into a full-time position to really start the digital marketing at Andy's List. And that is when I started to learn what I wanted to do when I grew up. I loved marketing. I loved the discipline of marketing. I loved the creativity. I loved the communication, the writing, the strategy, the data. And so I was like, I'm going to do a career in marketing. And it was there that I implemented a software tool called Compendium, where Steve and I met co-founder Ali Sales Roach in 2005. And it was the first time I had implemented software that was making my job easier. Because my job was to make Angie's List show up on search, right? Push down all the bad stuff, put up all the good stuff. So uh, that tool was making it a lot easier for me to do my job. So I took Ali out for lunch, and I said, I like what you're doing here. Like, are you hiring in marketing? And she's like, I only have four employees. <laughs> we don't even have a marketing department. But if you want to come in and do sales development, um, come on in. So anyway, that is really where I would say job number three, where I was like, I know what I want to be when I grow up. So I fell in love with software. Like, I want to put myself on a path to be a CMO for B2B software companies. And I'm going to do everything I can to put myself on that professional path, which is how it led me to all of these other companies, right? Because there's no master's degree that you can go to be a chief marketing officer. A lot of it is putting the tools, what I call, in your toolkit to make yourself a well-rounded executive and actually know how to perform the functions. So anyway, did that until um, I was at a healthcare tech startup, and I was part of a RIF. Um, and Steve probably knows these very well, but actually, of course, that when your company is spending more than you're selling, spending more than you're making, you have a couple ways to solve that, right? You can go raise more money, you can take out loans, or you can use your operational levers that you have available. People are really your number one lever, right? And so found myself, and that's a natural part of being a part of high growth, um, especially venture-backed companies. So found myself saying, okay, what am I going to do from here? And that's honestly what led me to start on I was consulting with a lot of great tech companies in Indianapolis, and we reconnected with Chris Baggett. And it happened to be at the, at the height, oh, here, keep me track, number one, uh, real world rejection, at least number three or four. Um, so at the height of the Flint, Michigan crisis is when all of this was happening. How many of you are aware of what happened there? Just, okay. Good, good. I mean, the number one <coughs> a crisis, the big water crisis that we will see in our lifetime, was completely preventable. 100% man-made, and as a result, um, the entire Flint population was poisoned with lead in the drinking water. And I sat down with Chris over coffee, thinking that maybe we'd talk about cluster truck or you know some other catch-up topic, and we ended up talking about the water. And he asked me a very simple question. He said, Megan, have you ever thought about testing your water? And I said, I didn't think that was a thing, right? Isn't that why I pay my water but yet, I, I pay a premium for everything else, right? My organic snacks for my kids, hormone-free uh, milk and uh, you know, uh, poultry or whatever. And so I went back that night and just did a ton of research, like how would I go about testing my water? And there really wasn't an option at the time. And so I went back to Chris and I said, I don't know what's here. Because mind you, I'm, I'm gainfully employed. I have a very successful consulting practice going on. But I said, but gosh darn it, like I was trying to test my water. There's not a good solution. And in a day and age where I can get my DNA tested for 23 and me, why can't I get my water tested? Um, I also called my water company. They said they didn't do that. They referred me to a lab and they said it would be about a thousand bucks. So at that point in time, I'm just a really frustrated uh, consumer of water and a mom on a mission because I want to know if I can make Easy Mac and I want to know if the water that my kids drink at their school is safe, right? Because they drink all the. So we went back to Chris, we found a couple other early investors, we ran about 100,000 bucks and launched 120 Water, uh, really focused on consumer tap testing, and launched that business, and five people bought the kits. <laughs> we were all on the news outlets, we got every sort of press uh, coverage that we get. Literally five people bought the kits, and I think it was my mom, <laughs> my dad, uh, Chris is why, I mean, it was, again, like, flop. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, world war, or, or, you know, real world, um, you know, fail number however many. But as we were launching the company, I got personally passionate about the state of drinking water in the U.S. Because I was like, if it can happen in Flint, like, is it going to happen in any place else? Is it going to happen where I live in Zion, Indiana? 
who regulates drinking water, what is, what is regulated within drinking water. Um, and, and so as I was learning the market and getting up to speed with the market, I realized that really there's some macro water quality issues that are facing the U.S. today. And Flint is not an isolated incident. I mean, every single day, all of my listening ears through Google Alerts and everywhere was like, school tests and fine lead here, Pittsburgh water has to replace pipes because lead is all over. And so I went back to my business partners and I said, okay, maybe this consumer thing isn't like taking off like we thought, but I think there's an opportunity to really use our products to address um, the gov space that is in a state of disarray. And they're testing all the time, they need a better way to manage their data, and so we actually pivoted the company to who we are today, which is a digital water platform. So we sell cloud-based software, consumables, like water testing kits, pitcher filters, other remediation devices to government agencies, so those that are regulating uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act, municipalities who have to execute rules within the Safe Drinking Water Act, and then other commercial facilities that have to execute it as well, like schools, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so anyway, we pivoted the business and prototyped a piece of software, um, as you kind of do when you're trying to get something off the ground, and we said, okay, we can get three people to pay for this. We'll go raise money and try to scale the company. We had $5,000 in the bank. Like this, we had nothing left <laughs> at this point. And sure enough, we took our prototypes, and within a six-month period of time, we landed over $2 million of contracts, including a $300,000 contract with Pittsburgh, which is why all the kids filled the conference room, and a um, whole state contract to do all of the data management and lead testing for schools in the state of Indiana. And that was a real pivotal moment because it funded the business for a period of time. It showed that we deserved to kind of uh, try to scale this business beyond just our few contracts. And so we went out to raise seed capital. And um, no one would give me money. So real world <laughs> rejection times 10. Like no, I was trying to raise like a million and a half dollars. We actually had a million in, in paying customers and no one would give me money. And, um, you know, except my early investors, I had some really good early angel investors who were willing to put in, but not enough that we needed to scale this business. So long story short, um, there was a pitch competition um, that was hosted by Steve Case, who was the founder of AOL. And his mission is to come to these over, uh, underserved areas around middle America and invest in companies that are revolutionizing the integrated industries. So that whole thesis. And it's called devising the rest. And they come in in a red van, and we literally, uh, we were both, we were selected, we were part of 10 companies that were selected to pitch, and we actually came out on top. And as soon as that happened, I had everybody lining up to complete my seat round. And that was really, you know, today, that pivotal moment to say, this business deserves some runway. It deserves some runway to scale beyond our early customers. And today, uh, we are across, you know, you use that as you 30 states uh, managing over 600,000 sample site locations. And my favorite, um, our programs have impacted well over 15 million lives at this point. Um, we are the fastest growing water tech startup ever, um, at least nationally, but globally, really. And we're not stopping there. So we're getting ready to enter our hyper growth phase and find our kind of next strategic partners to add more fuel on the fire, um, build more product, go global, um, and we have a whole list of roadmap items that we're looking to accomplish uh, into the future. So um, I hope that you know sharing this story and condensing 20 years <laughs> of work into 20 minutes, um, are, you have some questions or some takeaways that, that you're able to um, file away from when you need it. But um, again, I, if I had to sum up, uh, I think just some things that if I were in your shoes listening and trying to think 20 years down the line, some reassurance I would give you is one, that the education you're receiving now can take you anywhere you want to go, wherever that path may lead you. So if you're like me and you graduate and you have no idea what you're going to do, you will. And you have an alumni network here to help you figure that out. And that leads me to number two, utilize the DePauw community. There's a reason why I have um, 10 employees from DePauw. There's a reason why three out of the five companies I've joined um, are DePauw founded. Right? We are an amazing community that only wants to see this community succeed. And so never apologize for asking for time from an alum or uh, some other stakeholder in the network because we, you know, your future is, is, makes us as successful as well. And then never give up on an idea that gives you purpose. Um, my trajectory did not come without setbacks. Lots of no's, right? That's all part of the journey and those are all part of the scars 
that make you stronger. Um, so if you have an idea that you believe in your bones is worth getting up every day and pursuing, do it. And find mentors and find people in the community to help support you, because um, they're worth pursuing. So with that being said, I think uh, I'll turn it over for any questions. questions. Working? Great. Anybody have a question? Oh, where? Make me run. Can you say your name, your year before? Hi, I'm uh, Hudson Alden. I'm a first year management fellow. And um, I was wondering so, to most people starting up a business, the idea of finding it seems so difficult. Um, what do you recommend? Towards like coming up with an idea, like making it not seem so challenging. Yeah, making it not seem so challenging. Yeah. Um, again, back to that 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 purpose. Um, I mean, I said all along, if I knew how hard it was going to be to start a business in water, I don't know that I would have had the guts to actually do it. So I think there's kind of a sublime resilience that comes with when you have a good idea. You're kind of putting blinders on to pursue that idea and surrounding yourself like the Steves my mentor, Chris Baggett, to help you understand, like, what are the first five things that I should be thinking about? Because um, it, as you, as a founder, you're thinking about all the hundred of things, but that's when you really need to find, you know, the Steve's in the world, the Chris's in the world, to, to really kind of say, okay, but what's the first thing that I need to be focused on? Um, because there are methodologies and there are ways to go about, like, actually founding a business. So, um, kind of a cop out by say, utilize some network and find some people who have done it before you. Because when I say we're here to pay it forward, every entrepreneur, the pot or not, is jumping at the chance to pay it forward and especially share, share like lessons of what not to do uh, when you're starting. But again, I think having that network of people that have done it, they can kind of like say, you know, start with ABC, that XYZ, um, you know, is so critically important to launching your idea. Co-founders too, you know, early on, you know, people that have the idea are looking for people to work with them, and you can be a co-founder if you don't have the idea yourself. You may find yourself passionate about something that's somebody else's idea. I wanted to make sure we're we good up there. Okay, there is a video that I watched, and I meant to mention it earlier, uh, that somebody did of you. It's just, is there a way? Uh, and I'll share it later. But where was that app that like? It, at home, you know, you're talking about Zionsville oh, yes. and how this kind of happened. Yeah. That was the, that was literally part of the 70, first seventy five thousand we raised in that video. Okay. I'll send it out. It's yeah. On our website. Yeah, it's a great video um, that I think everyone should watch about early on where she found that passion. Question. My name is uh, Mia Davis, and I'm a first year management fellow. Um, when you pivoted from the consumer to the government space. Was there like a point in time where you're like, man, I should just cut my losses, like this isn't gonna work? Like what was really the motivator behind pivoting and going into that new space that you've never really like experienced and like been a part of before? A thousand percent. I mean if there were if I, I can't even count on both hands how many times I said, I, I I'm done, I'm out. Um, and that's you know, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. And the highs are the highest that you could ever describe, and the lows are I'm done, I'm out. Um, I think for me, the pivot is actually more of a natural, like I, I saw the impact that soft, what you, that software has on business. And so I felt kind of compelled to um, bring a lot of those best practices into water. And it was intimidating, you know, at first going into this new industry, but I did feel confident that I could make it better and I could provide better solutions to help their jobs um, be easier. And at the end of the day, I, I mean, I, 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 I was a personal passion. I like. I wanted to make sure that my my kids' schools were tested, and you know, I felt very passionate that everyone who wants to get their water tested or is drinking water from a tap <coughs> deserves to know what's in it. And I wasn't going to stop until until either we ran out of money or we stopped we stopped selling stuff. And neither of those things ever happened. Which is a good thing. Yeah. Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Widener, Sophomore Management Fellow. Um, as a Zionsville native, I guess my question is, what led you to being based out of Zionsville, Indiana? Great question. So we got a massive contract, and the co-working space, well, the incubator space called Z-Works, was the only space I could find to house my people. 
Um, but literally, my parents' garage in Stonegate and Zionsville was my fulfillment, and I housed my coders and my salespeople in the back of Z Works. It was literally because we had this contract to fulfill. Um, I knew the landlord, and boom. And, and we love the, the, the village ever since, but it was literally like, um, as a startup world, you gotta figure out a way to get this done. <laughs> Those co working spaces are great. They are great. Hi, my name is Hilly, uh, sophomore management fellow. So I have a question. Um, so when was the one time that you felt that really changed you and realized what you really want to do in life? Well, uh, yeah. Um, you know, that one time that it changed me, I realized I found what I wanted to do. Um, gosh, I, I don't know if it's a one time or just a series of, I really enjoy what I'm doing. Like, when, I think when you find yourself compelled to get better at your craft, Right, and you feel so compelled. I just want to get really great at this. Um, I, I can see myself. It's like it's back to the why didn't I? Why didn't I go to law school? I couldn't really see what my career was like in five years. When I found like marketing and knew that was my path, I knew I visualized see exactly what that looked like in five years. The companies that I would want to work for, the people I want to work with, the team I want to build. So um, I think I needed a few experiences to get to that kind of catalyst of okay, this is you know this is what I want to do and, and how I can visualize myself progressing over five years. So there's a progression for me. Anyone else have a question? And you know, going back to the thought on the, the idea, you know, it was how many years into your career before the idea, you know, that really brought you the passion? Oh, right. I mean, uh, she, I, she spent yeah. a lot of time uh, getting paid by other people. Grace Kinsey, Senior Management Fellow, and you talked a bit about your real world failures and you know it's one thing to not get a job but it's another to have a team of people that you're leading and your consumer product didn't go as well as you'd hoped. How do you keep that morale up and navigate? It's hard. I mean it's hard. Um, I mean I think the nature of when you join a startup or a growth stage company, it does take a type of person, like personality, to know that there are going to be setbacks and that every, like part of that job is experimentation and, and actually building process and building repeatability. So knowing that you have like-minded folks that you work with that you can discuss, well, that didn't go as planned. So let's pick ourselves up and move on is super important. That you surround yourself with people who are just ready for that journey and can be in the trenches with you. Because um, if you make bad hires that don't understand that, and can get spooked easily. There's nothing worse than trying to understand, hey, it's okay. Like, like this is totally part of building a business, pivoting, like, you know, raising capital, uh, going through droughts. Like, it's all normal. Um, so, again, I think that's where the building your team and making sure you have the right people on your team for the right stage to go through those things with you are super important. Anyone else? Yep. Allison Harvey, and I'm also a senior management fellow. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you ever had any doubts um, jumping from the consulting to your 120 water, and what kind of pushed you to make the jump into taking that chance? Yeah. Um, yes. Lot, yes. Uh, yes. Lots of doubts, and especially going um, into an entirely different industry where you're an outsider. Um, I have come to love, I, I'm a water nerd. Like, I'm an I'm a official club member of the Badass Women of Water. I love it. I, I love the industry. But I got, I mean, a lot of no's, and a lot of people didn't want to talk to me. I mean, so I, you know, I, um, I had a lot of doubt. Like, am I going to be accepted in this industry of, of PhDs, a lot of these people go to school to be water engineers, right? And who is this person coming from data and trying to say we need better tools to manage uh, the science, if you will. So um, it probably took about three years of 50% of my time was trying to win over the hearts and minds of the industry I wanted to pursue, and 50% was actually building a business. And um, thankfully, I think our work product spoke for itself, right? Once we started to get some early adopters and some proof points, of, oh my gosh, they actually are building stuff that's helping you know, our industry do better. 
then that spoke for itself, right? I had to do a lot less convincing. It's more, don't take my word for it. Ask our customers if that makes sense. But um, yeah, I mean, I would say I, I lived both, you know, one foot once I really believed in this, and two is I had a lot of people saying, you don't belong here. So I think it then back to like, um, Steve, you said starting a company when you're 35 with two kids and lots of scars probably gave me a little bit more um, ammo, if you will, than and probably my, my 22 year old self, that's for sure. Yeah, I would, the rise of the rest that, uh, you mentioned where there are 10 different, I mean, there was a competition to get to the 10 that actually got to present, but another company that presented that day was also DePaul alum, RJ Tallier, with Pattern 89. And so um, 120 was really kind of a newbie, and nobody really thought they were gonna win this because you know RJ and others were to really had, had made a lot of progress. So it really did catapult the company when, when uh, a female, Water company, you know, all of this really just beat out the the sure you know, who you thought was going to win. So overnight, uh, the company was just really brought out into the public, and things took off really quick. We have a question from someone in the alumni community, so I'll let Zaida ask you the question. Hey, Megan, um, we have one uh, question that has been submitted by our alumni that have joined us um, virtually. Dave Felling asks, please talk a bit about how the younger generation views entrepreneurship and how um, have aspirations changed? So how, ha how does the younger generation view entrepreneurship and how, how have aspirations changed? Yes. Oh, uh, I mean, that's a great, that's a great, and I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't think I, I can even put myself in the younger generation <laughs> anymore. Uh, uh, in fact, I mean, honestly, when I started in 120 Water, I was among the older founders that, uh, that, uh, that I was trying to raise money from, all these venture capitalists. I mean, most of these kids are 20 to, you know, 28 and doing really, really well. But, I mean, I, I think what I would like to say is I think there's so many examples of good that pursuing entrepreneurship is actually a, um, a legitimate path. I mean, now, you know, I think you have to go wisely and have mentors and have really good ideas because, you know, um, you know, you actually have to execute those good ideas. But I do think this whole knowledge of entrepreneurship as a field, as a potential career path, has actually been kind of legitimized in the younger generation. Um, and I do think things like the Board Fellowship um, that I know a lot of the uh, DePaul alums have gone through have also been people see examples of good that if you have a good idea, and it's worth pursuing, it doesn't matter if you're 22, 18, or 35, there's enough infrastructure um, to help you pursue that and be widely successful. So, I mean, I do think it's the, the if that is a actual career path, um, not necessarily I need to go get my MBA, then I need to go start a company or be a CEO. I do think, you know, culturally, we've seen it more acceptable to actually pursue entrepreneurship, which is super exciting for me when I think about uh, my work on economic development, job creation, and creating you know um, new companies and, and jobs in the future. So. Yeah, you mentioned that. What is the program that you work with David Becker on, or maybe over? But I know you're working with the government and in Indiana, and our alum Dave Becker that started First Internet Bank. For those of you who know, and Megan were part of the initial piece there. What is what was that program? Yeah, so David is actually chair and a founding member, and I'm on the board of an organization called ITIA, which is the Indiana Technology and Innovation Association. And our mission is literally to make sure that the tech industry is represented along other um, it, you know, fields like advanced manufacturing, healthcare, et cetera, because we have a, a big job drain here in Indiana. And this is not unique, unique to Indiana. Many states that are not on the coast um, do not have enough tech jobs to, um, that are open, if you will. So, um, so when I'm not doing 120, I, I, I spend my time working with the state of Indiana and others to help how do we level up and make sure that we have career paths not only now, but in the future for tech jobs, and then um, make sure that we are skilling up the workforce all, uh, through the governor's workforce cabinet as well um, to make sure that that's a pipeline uh, of talent that we can tap into. So, so yes, because we all need jobs. People are everything. <laughs> and there are internship opportunities, both summer and yes. semester-long internship opportunities as well. So if anything has struck your uh, interest today, come to the McDermott Center and talk to one of us about that as well. We've got time for maybe one more question and then we're gonna actually do the medal ceremony. Yeah. Uh, 
Thanks, Megan. Hey, I'm Jake Labus. I'm a senior manager fellow as well. I'm just wondering, kind of asking about the water nerd comment you had, but like, what's the most alarming fact that you've learned about water that you think everyone should know that they might not be aware of? I'm sure that you like look at the water bottles, look at tap water a lot differently now, and I'm sure I'm just interested to hear if you have any like fact that you think people should know about that probably drives you. What I like to say is I am the buzzkill at the cocktail party. Because if you get me on this subject, I will just start rattling stuff off that never goes out of your mind and is actually kind of uh, <laughs> uh, depressing. Um, so I'm going to give you one, the most recent one that I've heard that I can't get out of my mind, is that the, um, the average consumer of water drinks a credit card worth of microplastics every single week. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa! Yeah, that is not, that's not good. That's, uh, swipe or no swiping. Okay. One more question. Anybody? We only got time for one more. If you sneak it in. Uh, can't get that out of our mind. Where? Good. Hello, uh, I'm Jackson Tryon, I'm a freshman manager. My name's Jackson Tryon, I'm a freshman manager fellow, and I was wondering, what's your next big goal for 120 Water? Oh my gosh, um, gosh, I have lots of goals for 120 Water. Um, so I, I think my next, this is a very aspirational goal. So we are at uh, 15 million lives impacted. I want to get to a billion. And that means that you know our solution is implemented in the majority of water systems and state regulated agencies who are managing the most programs than any other entity in the United States. So uh, we have less than 2% market share right now, so we have a lot of ways to go, which is why we need the growth capital and great people to join our team. But yeah, but we want to, um, we want to expand uh, quite rapidly and make sure our reach is as big as possible. Great question. And you know, um, I've read this in stories that you guys are, have written, as, and I follow kind of the what's happening at 120 closely, but um, you know, the municipalities have budget issues, and so oftentimes the water treatment and the things that the septic system, you know, all of that system, the infrastructure of large um, cities is hampered, so the importance more than ever of having your own water treated and knowing, or having your own water tested because you, it might be great at the site, but what's it traveling through to get to your actually tap can be some very old, um, very old type very of piping. Yes. <laughs> yes. So you, it, it is kind of important when you buy a house and when you do different things to make sure you're testing your water. So, yes. thank. Let's give Megan a round of applause. <laughs> And of course, I forgot my notes. I, I did forget at the beginning to thank our co-sponsors of this event, so I wanted to make sure I did that as well, which, um, here we go. Our de uh, development alumni engagement uh, that's, that has many people involved as uh, thankfully promoting this across the alumni community as well as um, the uh, McDermott Medal uh, this is not just our normal McDermott speaker series, but the McDermott Medal Honor presentation. And so now I'm going to bring up Dr. White to actually do the actual presentation. Afterward, we'll have a little photo op, and then we will uh, be adjourning. But uh, Dr. White. <laughs> Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you. I am so inspired, Megan, uh, by you and. Um, I, like the students, took away many valuable messages. One, of course, the value of a liberal arts degree. Um, the other, that our careers and lives are not straight lines. Uh, and much of what uh, we end up doing, we couldn't imagine doing uh, when we were first year students, second year students, third year students, uh, or seniors. Uh, that um, making mistakes 
Um, failures, rejection um, don't mean the end of the world. Uh, it's just another opportunity uh, to gather ourselves and figure out another way to be successful. Uh, and finding something that you're passionate about um, is really ultimately the key to success. So thank you so much for sharing those inspirational words. So now I have the opportunity to present the McDermott Medal. And I'm going to read a little bit about the medal. First of all, you are joining other former prestigious honorees that include Dan Hassler, David Becker, who we've already mentioned, Jensen Green, Alan Hubbard, Jane Rizzi, excuse me, Jan Rizzi, Jeffrey Harmonine, Angie Hicks, who you worked for, Thomas Cooper, and Justin Christian, uh, just to name a few. And to receive the honor, the recipient must have demonstrated the following attributes. The individual has been instrumental in the formation or growth of an entrepreneurial business venture in a small or large organization. So check. <laughs> They've demonstrated a long record of excellence in leadership and management. Check. As well as actively assisting others in establishing entrepreneurial businesses or initiatives. Check to that one as well. Recipients must have a proven history of unique displays of creativity and innovation in entrepreneurial leadership or entre entrepreneurial behavior within a larger organization. And the individual is either a DePaul alumnus, a friend or supporter of DePaul, or a gracious supporter of the state of Indiana. So all of those, I would say check, check, check. So Megan Casey Glover, you have demonstrated a lifetime career of entrepreneurship, creativity, innovation, and impeccable leadership skills in managing organizations of all sizes. You have also shared your knowledge and experience with others through serving on corporate boards and lecturing at various universities, including your alma mater. And throughout your career, you've embodied excellence in everything that you do. So it is therefore my great honor to award you, Megan Casey Glover, with the Robert C. McDermott Medal for Excellence in Entrepreneurship.